from the FAIC. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, I welcome you back. And um, I just wanted to show a few slides about using the website. Um, remember, if you need to reset your password, this is the email address. If you have questions and you want to contact me directly, not through the discussion, you can use my email address and I will answer you. Um, so when, when you see, when you're looking at a live event, here, this is what you'll see. When I posted the webinar, this is what you'll see. So I, last time I posted it about a couple of hours afterwards. So um, there's, there's that thing about the webinar. Um, and then, uh, so remember that I don't care when you see the webinar, whether you see it live or whether you see the recording but you do need to see them all. And then underneath their assignments, so there's assignment for week one, which I posted right after the webinar, and there was a quiz. And both of these are pass-fail. The quiz you can answer many times, and it's just to go over the points of what we did, and I will post those right after the live webinar. And then finally, there are handouts, and you can find them in the um, under the handout thing. So these are the handouts for last week. The handouts for this week are 2.1, and they're at the bottom of this list. And and if you have any questions, there's the fact. So um, you can look there. It should answer most of your questions. But if not, send me email. And that's all I have to say. We'll turn it over to Mark Wamling from PACN. He's our course coordinator. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Susan. Uh, welcome, everybody. Our speaker today is Jim Williams. He is the exhibit designer and preparator for the Kent State University Museum. The museum focuses on collecting and preserving historic and contemporary costumes textiles and fashion design. Jim has been working in exhibition production for over 30 years at a variety of institutions and also served as the lead technician and project manager for a regional conservation lab. Outside the museum, Jim designs and creates uh, studio furniture on his own. Uh, so I'd like to thank Jim for joining us today and we look forward to your presentation. Okay, well thank you Mark, and welcome everybody. Good afternoon or morning if it's still morning where you are. Um, we are going to take a look at furniture and fixtures for small museums. So a little bit about how to build some casework and platforms and the like. So if I can get my slides to start clicking forward here. One second, okay. So quick overview, Mark just kind of told you a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while, and all the institutions that I've been involved with, we built all of our casework in-house. So what we're going to discuss um, first is object safety and preventive conservation, which is why we do casework in the first place. We'll touch a little bit on um, what kind of materials we want to use, and how to protect your objects from the materials themselves. Uh, then we're going to go into a brief discussion about setting up your own shop. If you don't have one already, um, this will cover all the tools, um, some basic techniques. And then we'll go into a very basic uh, pedestal design, a um, couple of different ideas for that, some wall cases and ideas for how you can build those. Um, platforms, which as you can see in the photograph, I tend to use a lot because of what my museum collects. And then we'll take some uh, questions and hopefully I will provide some answers for you um, about what you can do in your own place. <clears throat> so um, to start with, first order of business, why do we build casework? Well, we build casework to protect things. Um, we need to protect them from our audience. Um, 
everybody knows that people will want to reach out and touch uh, what you put on display. We need to create a barrier to things that are in the environment itself, dust, um, fumes, cleaners, um, all that kind of stuff. We can use casework to help mitigate climate changes. If you're a historic house or you just have a wacky HVAC system, sometimes you need to control that um, at a microclimate level. We will look at you know, the materials that you build the casework, uh, how to keep that from harming things. And we have to consider that when we're designing. Um, as you design your casework, you really have to consider how the objects are going to be put into them, um, how they're going to be taken out, and try to minimize any risks that might occur during the actual installation or deinstallation. And we all want to um, use our casework to maximize the visitor's experience. So we want to provide the best access to viewing but the best protection for the object, keeping in mind that not all of our um, visitors will have the same um, mobility or acuity. So we have to think about that in the casework, too. So in our perfect world, um, the environment is made up of things that are <clears throat> inert and safe, but not always the case. So our goal is to create an environment that is uh oh I'm having trouble here. It says my connection is lost, Mike. Sorry. I've lost it. Okay. I've advanced the slides for you, Jim. Okay. <laughs> well I can't see what I'm what I'm reading, so um okay, so in a perfect okay. world we will um have uh, good products. And so when we're talking about wood, we have to think about the fact that wood itself degrades. And any cellulosic materials can outgas uh, volatile organic compounds. And so we have to think about whether we can seal them either using barrier films or liquid coatings or um, you know, other, other methods of or using other materials within the case. <clears throat> so um, plywoods uh, all have uh, glue involved, and so some of those glues, there we're going back. Um, some of those glues in, are made with a um, urea formaldehyde, which can be harmful. So we want to try to find materials that are made with a phenol formaldehyde glue, which is less harmful. Um, MDF is a uh, composite board that um, is basically compressed wood fibers. And the glues in those, same thing. We want to try to find the, the least uh, harmful uh, products. So, um, and I, um, I did make a handout with a bunch of different materials. So I'm not going to go over each and every one here. So um, also within the case, you can have plastics and foams. Each of those can have their own chemical makeup. Uh, some of that will vary by manufacturer. So you want to um, consider what possible uh, contaminants are going to come from those. And even fabric can't be considered safe without uh, testing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then as you paint your case, you want to look for low VOC finishes. VOC stands for volatile organic compounds. Um, latex paints, water-based uh, polyurethanes are considered safer than uh, oil or solvent-based uh, finishes. So how can we how can we do have some control over these pollutants um, in the case environment? The first is of course to seal the wood and to keep it out of the case altogether. So um, we'll take a look at one uh, method of sealing uh, or encapsulating wood that's in, within the case environment. We can control the rate of air exchange, which is to use gaskets to limit the amount of air that's either coming into or leaving the case. Uh, you can use absorbents like artsorb or uh, oxygen scavengers to basically capture the pollutants and hold them away from the objects. 
Um, you can actually put in active ventilation. Uh, sometimes your object is the thing that is outgassing, and it could affect other objects in the case. So you want to pull air out of the case or through the case using uh, fans and filters. And you're going to hear a lot about ADI testing as you um, go through your museum careers. And um, you know, the ADI test is a useful tool. And I have a little video here from the Indianapolis Museum of Art that will explain what that is. tests that have been run. The Audi test um, uses metal coupons, uh, silver, a lead, and a copper coupon. And um, they're fitted into platinum cured silicone stoppers like this. These are the most expensive part of the test. Um, we put a little bit of water into one of these capillary tubes, slip it into the test vessel. Uh, we'll take two grams of the material that we're testing. Um, we've tested paint in here. Uh, we've tested wood veneer material here that we didn't expect to. Good results. Uh, this is some silicone tape. The objects conservators wanted to see if it was safe to use. Uh, I've got ultra suede. We use this to uh, cover uh, mounts. And we test every color because uh, with different dye stuffs, you can get different results. So we put two grams of our sample in the tube. Uh, we put in uh, water in the little capillary tube. Uh, we've got our metal coupons and our silicone stopper. And we seal the tube, and then we pop it in an aging oven that's set at 60 degrees centigrade. And we keep it in there for 28 days. And what we want to see is, does any corrosion form on any of these metals? Is there some acidic component that's off-gassing? Is there something that's going to cause problems well, my um, screen and is showing metal? Video and we extrapolate ended. from this. <clears throat> um, maybe it's not metal that you're exhibiting, but if there is a material that is causing problems with metals, then we'll choose not to use that for long-term or even sometimes for short-term temporary. So screening method that helps us a lot. Okay, I'm not sure if all of you were able to see the whole video, um, but I'm going to move on because it looked like it ended on my end. Um, so the Audi test, basically, um, you put the material in, you test it against several metals. And while it's not a perfect test, it's a very useful way so that we can see if materials are outgassing at all. And then we extrapolate from that and use that to determine what's safe and what is not. Um, if you're like me, though, you have to be very careful with your budget. and. Um, Smaller institutions are going to be challenged to meet the ideal uh, in terms of materials and products because, A, the materials are often quite expensive. Um, if you're not in a city, then finding the, um, finding the materials in the first place can be a little trickier. Um, luckily, the internet exists for us. But um, you will have to pay um, freight to get things in, so that's a consideration. And then audit testing is expensive, so it's difficult for a smaller institution to um, dedicate that kind of time and um, material for, for doing it. But what can we do to find the best materials? Well, luckily, museum folks seem to like to share uh, what they know. And so there are some excellent resources available um, out there, the first of which is the Conservation Wiki. And they have a, an audit test materials database that people contribute to, and they'll submit their test results for specific products and share that so that you can look up products there and um, basically use other folks' uh, data to make your decisions. 
Um, STASH is another great organization on the web that tests and releases information about products. So even while they're more um, focused on storage, um, a lot of that information is um, germane to making casework. Uh, this book is probably the Bible on museum pollutants by Pamela Hatchfield. I would highly recommend that if you don't have a copy, you get one. Um, she goes through a lot of the different materials and the considerations and what you need to look for. Um, Brent Powell has a great book on collection care that also includes some information uh, about materials testing. But at the end of the day, um, you're going to have to do the best you can with what you have available. I mean, everyone's reality is going to be a little bit different. Um, we all love to do it at the same level as the big boys, but um, that's not always going to be possible. So you need to excuse me, <clears throat> do your homework on the objects, find out what their vulnerabilities are, and then seek out um, what the best solutions are going to be for you. No solution is going to work for every, every type of object. So now we've kind of gone over a little bit about materials. We can't really go that far in depth uh, without um, getting too crazy. So um, let's move on and start talking about what you'll need to set up a shop to actually build the products that you need. Um, oh, there's another video screen. <clears throat> so um, you know, first of all, you're going to need you're going to need a basic set of hand tools. Um, this is just the run-of-the-mill stuff that you'll be familiar with, hammers and mallets, um, screwdrivers, uh, various different types, and measuring tools of various stripes. And some of you might already have a lot of this stuff in your shops, um, for sure. Um, wrenches and sockets, in case you need to use um, Stronger fasteners or fasteners that just require that, um, you know, basic pliers. So this is all pretty, pretty uh, standard stuff. And we're going to go over all these in a little bit more detail in a minute. So, um, but you also will need power hand tools. I don't really talk about hand saws because they're not going to be useful in this um, kind of construction uh, unless you're supremely talented. <laughs> and, uh, there we go again. So um, in power hand tools, we're going to be needing to look at jigsaws and circular saws for cutting, um, drills for making holes and driving fasteners, um, routers for cutting and profiling, um, joining tools for assembly, sanders for finishing, uh, chop saws for cross-cutting and cutting angles. And then we will. Um, also need to, if you if your budget and your space allows, and you're going to set up a full permanent shop, then you'll look at stationary equipment like table and band saws, um, perhaps a joiner and planer, um, and that's if you're getting into more solid wood construction. Um, a drill press for drilling more accurate and uh, better holes, and uh, if you can really afford it, a panel saw for um, sizing down sheet goods and cutting larger materials. So. <clears throat> um, one of the things that's going to be critical, of course, if you are not familiar at all with woodworking, is safety. Um, I can't stress enough that woodworking is a dangerous occupation. And at the very least, you will need to provide for yourself and your staff good eye protection, hearing protection, um, protection from respiratory irritants because wood dust is um, potentially carcinogenic. And so you will also want to spend um, time finding a good place to get training, hands-on training with uh, woodworking tools. So, um, moving on again. Um, We'll just take a quick, uh, more thorough look at some of the uh, power tools that you're going to encounter. So um, hand tools, you probably already um, have a pretty good idea how to use. And if you don't, maybe this isn't the field you want to go into. But um, 
So first, you'll you'll want to have drills handy. Drills are great for not only making holes, but also for shooting fasteners, uh, building the cabinets, uh, installing the shows. It's they're very useful. You'll probably want a cordless one because they're more portable. Um, corded ones are slightly more powerful, and hammer drills if you have concrete in your institution. Um, the jigsaw. Uh, is a is a great tool for making curve cuts and rough cuts in lumber, and um, also if you need to make a hole in a panel. Um, <clears throat> I'm really having trouble here. Um, so that's that's what a jigsaw is used for. Uh, Circular saw is probably going to be the workhorse if you don't have a stationary stationary equipment. Um, that's going to be the tool that you can go to for straight cuts uh, and angled cuts and for making cabinetry. Um, routers are also going to be very useful hand tools. Routers, um, the cutting bit is perpendicular to your um, your cut. I just got my slides back, so um, and they can be used to cut profiles, to cut grooves, to uh, use as a with templates to make complex shapes uh, repeatable, and then a a chop or miter saw is good to have in um, in your shop for doing the framing work uh, for cross-cutting lumber, basically cutting angles and miters and lumber. And sanders will help you finish your casework. <clears throat> um, so you'll want to look at a couple different kinds of sanders, like an oscillating or, or a random orbit, to make a, a good finish on your cabinets. Other hand tools you might want to look at are pneumatic tools, which are air-powered instead of electrical-powered. They'll help you uh, shoot fasteners. You can buy drills and sanders that are pneumatic, but I'm really more concentrated on the uh, the fastener shooting type. Um, biscuits and domino joiners are ways to join wood without showing any fasteners or having holes to patch. And these work by cutting mating slots in the two pieces of wood that are then joined with a, a third piece that uh, slips in between them. Um, if you're buying a router, you can buy it with a fixed base, which is um, just what you think, or a plunge base where you can actually go in in light passes and cut um, multiple passes in wood or start and stop a cut uh, on a panel at precise spots. A uh, laminate trimmer is just a small router that you can use for trimming or chamfering. And then if you do need to include some metal in your work, you might want to have an angle grinder on hand. But if you have the space, you're going to want to set up a permanent shop. And the first tool you'll want to buy is a table saw. This is the workhorse of the shop. Um, it makes accurate straight cuts. They're, the fence makes everything repeatable, so you're making things exactly the same size. Uh, the blade tilts so you can cut miters and bevels. Um, it's really the most useful tool in the shop. <clears throat> Second to that is the bandsaw, which is a looped blade. Um, basically a big circle that runs on wheels. And uh, the bandsaw excels at cutting curves. Um, it's also really useful if you're cutting foam. Um, but it's a uh, good enough tool for cut making straight cuts, too. A drill press is going to help you with uh, precise hole drilling, including uh, being able to stop the depth of your hole. So if you're setting magnets in to hold panels in place, uh, that's a really good thing to be able to do. Uh, the joiner and planer are really a little bit more advanced. They're more for solid wood woodworking, but what they can do is uh, help you if you have um, lumber that's not particularly straight and flat. You can straighten it out and make uh, mill your lumber to the exact dimension that you want. Um, this is a stationary sander, which is a, a good tool for just shaping and sort of trimming wood. Um, or for just shaping uh, more random shaped objects. 
And lastly, this is the panel saw, which is essentially a hybrid of a circular saw and a table saw, meaning that you bring the wood to it, but then you move the saw carriage uh, through the wood itself. And this is just going to save your back and um, allow you to make really good, accurate cuts in your panels. Now, the machines basically are just the motors, and the blades are what is going to do the work. So I'm going to just really quickly go through some of the blades you'll want to look at. All of these I would highly recommend for saw blades, especially circular saw blades, getting carbide tooth um, blades because they'll last longer. But um, so these are essentially a disc with teeth on the edges. Um, a cross-cut blade is going to have more teeth uh, for cutting across the grain smoothly. A rip blade has fewer teeth, and that's um, because you're cutting parallel to the grain, and the um, stringiness of the wood can bind up, and so fewer teeth is better. But often you just want to buy a combination blade, which will do both jobs pretty well, um, and it's, it's a lot more versatile. If you're getting into specialty materials like plastics, there are specialty blades for that. And then this is a dado set, and these you stack up the number of blades you need to cut the width of a groove in the wood, and um, they're going to be really useful in the dado joint that I show you in a few slides from now. Um, bandsaw blades you choose based on their width and their teeth count. The narrower the blade, the tighter the radius that you can cut, and the finer the tooth, the smoother the cut will be. And so. On the left there is a, um, a metal cutting blade, which is almost like a hacksaw. So you can get quite a variety there. Excuse me. Um, OK, so getting away from saw blades, these are router bits. There are hundreds of kinds available for lots of different profiles, lots of different purposes. Um, the straight bits will cut you know, straight flat bottomed grooves or follow a template. The um, bearing guided bits will um, allow you to do edge work or to follow a template again. Um, you can make moldings. You can make dovetails. Uh, there's just a lot you can do with, with various types of router bits. And drill bits are also, there's a lot of variety there too. So you know the basic one you're familiar with is probably the twist bits in that yellow box in the lower left. Um, but there are also spade bits which are in the upper right, which cut bigger holes but are kind of rough. Uh, Forstner bits, which are in the lower right, which cut uh, very precise flat-bottomed holes, which are great for setting magnets. Uh, countersink bits are sitting on the white piece of paper. And those um, are used to cut a hole that has a recess for the screw head, and it helps keep your wood from splitting and also hides, makes it easier to fill the holes when you do a, shoot a screw. And then brad point bits in the upper left um, just tend to go straighter through the wood because they have a leading point. Um, lamps, you can't have too many or too many types. So I'll just go through these real quick. Um, a pipe clamp is, let me grab my little arrow here. Um, oops, not going to go. So the pipe clamp is the orange headed one right here. And that is uh, a cheap way to get good clamps. You just buy the heads and then buy cheap black pipe to, to make, uh, make the rest of it. Um, bar clamps come in a couple different varieties. The Bessie clamps, which are this one and this one, have parallel jaws. So they help when you're building cases to keep everything squared up. Uh, light duty bar clamps, this guy. Just real useful for a variety of different clamping applications. Um, these I didn't picture, but they're uh, a wooden head clamp that's real gentle on materials. Band clamp kind of surrounds this whole uh, group of clamps. And that's um, these are great if you're building mitered cases. You can just bind them around and tighten everything at once and do all four joints at once. And then um, miter clamps are. You can buy larger ones. These are just little spring clamps that work to hold miters together while they dry. Um, C clamps up here, and A clamps are just you know standard 
good clamps to have around. Okay. <clears throat> so first things first, this is not a not a lesson in woodworking, but I'm going to show you how to make a couple of the basic cuts for um, cabinet building using a circular saw and a table saw. Um, I really highly advise you to get, get good training. And these are the three basic joints that we're going to cover. The butt joint on the left, my arrow here, is um, just basically cutting two boards at 90 degrees and putting them together side by side or perpendicularly, excuse me. Um, the miter joint, you're going to cut the boards at an angle, and those angles will mate. The nice thing about a miter joint is this clean edge. If you're doing a butt joint or a dado, you're going to have plywood edge showing here, and um, that'll have to be dealt with with your sanders. <clears throat> and then thirdly, a dado joint is a very good, strong, self-aligning joint. Um, and I'll show you real quickly how you can do that. So this is um, going to be a really brief primer on using a circular saw to make a cut. Um, first thing you want to do is mark your sheet where you want that cut to be. And um, what I didn't say about the circular saw earlier was that you really would do well to buy a very good straight edge guide to work with um, because that is going to be critical to getting square cabinets. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you'll measure the distance from the edge of the base plate of your saw to the tooth of the saw blade, and keep that measurement handy because you're always going to set your guide that far away from uh, where you want the cut to be. So the um, the key here. So I was going to cut a, an inch off this panel, and so my saw has a very odd dimension of 5 and 1 16th, so this is set to 6 and 1 16th away from the edge of the board. And you'll double and triple check that uh, measurement uh, and clamp it in place with C-clamps. When you set your saw, set it about an eighth of an inch thicker or deeper than the thickness of your board because you don't really have to have your blade sticking way below. It's not safe, and uh, there's no real benefit to it. And then you'll line your saw up. You can see um, here with the edge along your straight edge. Uh, you'll start off the board, get the motor running, and then push it through uh, nice and cleanly. And keep moving all the way until your blade safety cover snaps back into place and shut off the motor. And you've just made a good straight square cut. Now with a circular saw, it depends on the manufacturer. Some of these you can set to tilt at a 45 degree angle to cut miters with, um, and that can be really useful. So that was a circular saw. I'm going to fly in blind here. Um, so now I'm going to cover the, uh, the table saw. And that's going to be a lot more controllable. Uh, the table saw is essentially just a circular saw flipped upside down and mounted to the table. So you're moving the wood through the blade rather than moving the blade uh, through through the wood. So um, I'm not going to be sure right now which slides are coming up, but um, you're going to want to check to make sure you have a good straight edge that's going to ride against the fence. That's first and foremost. And then you will set the fence to the um, exact uh, position that you want, size that you want to cut. Uh, again, you're going to set the depth of your saw to just slightly deeper than the um, thickness of the wood. And I find it's really useful to make sure that your wood is in a handy position uh, before you turn on the saw. So if you're going to cut a stack of boards, you want to have them ready to go right nearby. And then you'll fire up your saw and put the straight edge against the fence, um, hold it down firmly to the table <clears throat> and against the fence, and slide it through. 
and um, push all the way past uh, the blade to make sure that um, you're clear because the most dangerous part is just on the back side of the blade. And so once you've done that, if you have uh, multiple boards to cut, you can just keep running them without resetting the fence. <clears throat> um, hopefully I covered everything that was on that slide because I can't see it right now. And um, I'm going to move on to cutting a rabbit and dado joint on the table saw. So uh, you're going to want to set the inside of the groove exactly the distance equal to the thickness of the wood being used. So I tend to work from reality, and I'll use an actual piece of plywood against the fence and set the blade there. And then that way I'm sure when that joint is put together, the face of the board with the rabbit is going to be flush with the edge of the board that has the dado groove. Um, <clears throat> and it'll take some practice and some test pieces. I, I typically um, keep a lot of wood handy uh, and do tests with scraps. And you'll want to uh, just keep dialing it in until you get as perfect a fit as you as you can when those two are slipped together. With the router, you're going to, it's very similar to using the circular saw in terms of you're going to set the um, straight edge guide, the distance from the edge of the bit to the edge of the base away from your cut. You're going to set the depth of the cut. What is going on? Having a problem here. <clears throat> okay, blind, blind. Um, so you're going to uh, use a straight bit, and you're going to. Um, Set that and do test cuts just like you would on the table saw. And um, if you're using a, a bearing guided bit, you're going to, excuse me for one second, please. <clears throat> um, I'm, I apologize for this. Um, I can't see my slides right now, but you will um, <clears throat> have to keep the guide to the left side of the router as you're cutting because the speed of the bit will pull the router against the fence as you're going and um, help you control the cut better. So, Jim, we're just at the, right, I'm uh, move at on to the last bullet of uh, the cutting rabbit and dado joints at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, can't, I don't have internet at all, Mike. I don't know what's going on, but something is not connecting anymore. Okay. Well, let's, uh, um, let's go ahead with the slides. Um, uh, do you have a copy of the PowerPoint in front of you? Yeah, I'm and, I'll just, that, and I'll just okay. go ahead and advance for the participants. Okay, if you can just give me a second to get that pulled up, I'll be yep. right with you. I apologize, I should have that in the background. While they're doing that, I'll just for a second give Jim a minute to do that. Uh, just want to make a point that uh, obviously there's a lot involved in trying to do your uh, cases in-house. If something that uh, you don't want to do, 
obviously you can get uh, someone else to do it, and it's a value to see what's involved in the detail and what, what a contractor could offer. Uh, so if you're not interested in doing all this work, I think this information is valuable to kind of really understand the dynamics of what goes into making cases. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, I think it does uh, come into play even if you don't want to do this yourself. It's also good to be able to speak with any contractors that you might be using and try and speak their language a little bit. So. Exactly. <clears throat> So this is, this is all right. Well, we're going to just jump ahead a little bit. Um, I talked about cutting some joints, um, assembling the cases. You're going to use your clamps and hold them together. Um, you can shoot a variety of fasteners, screws, nails, um, biscuit joints, and um, I'll I'll kind of skip over that a little bit. And hopefully, these slides will be available for you to to take a look through. Um, once they come back online. I'm fortunately having some computer issues right now and um, can't even pull up my, my PowerPoint. So um, so as Mike's advancing the slides, let's go to a basic pedestal with a vitrine and we'll start talking about the actual casework and um, what it's going to look like as you're building it. Go ahead whenever you're ready. I am ready. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So a uh, basic pedestal is, you've probably all seen these in museums. It's a basic plywood box construction. Uh, the corners can be joined with any of those joints that we just talked about. And um, it's just going to depend on your preferences and your tooling. The top deck, which is the recessed area, uh, under the vitrine, um, that can be sealed to reduce the pollutants that we had discussed earlier. I'm going to show you how to do that with the marble seal on the next couple of slides. But the um, the rabbit around the edge is going to receive the vitrine, um, and you'll get that really smooth, classic look. Now, there are lots of other ways that you can dress this up. You can put frames around the underside of the vitrine. Um, you can make your cabinets as decorative as you want, but this is going to be just the basic um, idea of what you can uh, what you can accomplish with that. Um, some handy tips, you're going to want to have leveling feet because if your museum is like mine, the floors are not level. Uh, the toe kick that I've kind of on this drawing shown, that little recess at the bottom, it gives you a kind of a transition between the cabinet and the floor. So that can be painted to match your floor. Or it can be the same material as the floor. But it also serves as a place that can hold ballast if you need to, if you have a top heavy or a particularly heavy piece on top and you want to make sure you're counterweighted. Um, it, so it serves a couple of different things. As far as the vitrine itself goes, I highly recommend that you find a good contractor in your area that can do the fabrication for you. Um, Building with plexiglass is difficult, it's toxic, it requires specialty tools, and it's just not really something that um, just anyone can do. So, um, so here are a couple of different ideas. So the toe kick you can see in the, in the top left is just like a little reveal, and I usually put a gusset in the corner put in a threaded insert, and then use leveling feet. And then that way I can make sure that my cabinet fits stable, is perfectly plumb, and um, the object isn't going to be at risk of vibration. And as I said, you can put a full board across that and add weight to counterweight a top-heavy um, installation issue. The, um, the top deck I build separately from the case and then screw in from the underside. And that way I can completely encapsulate that with marble seal, upholster it, and it keeps all the pollutants out from the um, rest of the box out of the case. And so in the upper right, you can see what just the bottom part of the pedestal looks like. So to isolate the deck, there are a couple ways. Um, but mostly, museums are using marble seal, which is a laminated um, 
poly, polypropylene film with nylon and aluminum, and that is probably the best vapor barrier available on the market right now. Um, if you think about your daily yogurt, uh, that's what they use to seal those little plastic cups. <clears throat> and so um, one of the nice things about Marvel Seal is that it can be tacky when it's heated, and so you can iron it directly onto the wood. And so I wrap it around the edges and make you know the cleanest corner I can. And then on the underside, I'll wrap it around, but then use foil tape because hopefully my gasket is going to protect, you know, that little bit that's left in the middle from from gassing into the uh, into the um, cabinet. Um, when you're upholstering it, just try to avoid stapling through the barrier uh, because anytime you perforate it, you're going to um, you're going to reopen the wood and allow some gases to get out. Um, so if you can avoid it, that's that's the best. And so with the gasket on the between wedge, and so what I'm talking about is um, putting it right on that top edge, and then the between will sit on top of it, and so will this deck. And that should seal everything off um, within the case. And Marble Seal is available through Gaylord and Conservation Materials and a lot of other conservation suppliers. So you should be able to get your hands on that pretty readily. Now that's a basic pedestal. And as I said, you can dress these up however you want. Um, you, there are a couple hundred thousand options of what you can actually do with it, depending on how much design work you want to do. But I wanted to show you uh, one other option, which is a uh, space saver pedestals. And I designed these for our institution because, like many of us, I have very little storage space. And I need to maximize that to the extent possible. So these pedestals are built with a separate base and top. And the base itself breaks down. And what I do is use bed hardware. And that allows me to pack these flat like IKEA. And um, I can fit all the legs for all the pedestals I have on one cart in my storage. And then the boxes can stack on pallet racking or shelving. And so I can stack those up as high as my ceiling allows. And that really is a, a great um, space saving <clears throat> uh, plan, I guess. And um, so this last photo on the lower right is the underside of the deck. And so those little ribs will lock into the, um, the slots on the base, and then they're screwed together. And these have leveling feet and everything, so they, they work pretty well. And in my case, I have a raised deck on these. These are painted. They're not uh, marble sealed. And if you want to, you can incorporate a desiccant chamber or um, you know some kind of an absorbent chamber with um, scavengers to reduce pollutants in your deck. So that's really, there's not that much to say about pedestals. There's, you know, they're basically a box with a display uh, surface on the top. And so um, if you have questions about other ideas for pedestals, um, please let me know, and we'll try to get to those. <clears throat> but for now, I'm going to move on to uh, building some simple wall cases. And these I use in my museum. There's uh, two types. Um, one is just basically a shadow box frame in the lower left. And the other is a um, four-sided between uh, wall case. And that's on a wall wedge. So these are you know, a little bit more finished than a basic shelf. And um, they're very secure. I have a couple different designs that I use. This is one that's a little easier to build than the wedge shape, which is basically just a box and a frame. Um, it hangs on a cleat on the wall. So these are just matching bevels that uh, slip together. You've probably seen those in other cases. <clears throat> and you can modify these in a number of different ways to include label rails or pin boards. Your mounts can screw directly into the back. Um, they're lightweight, they're easy to move around, and they keep your floor space clear. And as far as building them, they're pretty simple. It's basically just a um, 
back frame um, that's made out of plywood, and then a simple torsion box on the bottom. You can kind of see the construction here. So this can be shot together with pneumatic nailers or screws. You can use miter joints, butt joints, skittle joints, whatever you want. But your deck and back are separate, and so if you need to seal them to protect uh, the objects inside from pollutants, they can be wrapped in marble, sealed, and then assembled uh, with gaskets. And then hopefully you can see here a little bit better how that French cleat works, which is just the board behind has a bevel that points out, and the board on the top of the case has a bevel that points in, and they just slip together. It's very secure. They'll hold a ton of weight. And if you'd like to get a little bit uh, fancier with these, you can um, build a raised deck. You can put in uh, desiccant chambers. You can use the wedge-shaped base, which makes the bottom of the case essentially disappear, which is a nice aesthetic choice. And um, you know, these are these are something that you can flip into any gallery. They, you know, you can build them probably up to about 24 inches deep before they get too unwieldy. Um, but for small objects, they're, they're very useful to have. And then um, a shadow box is just a, um, a very simple frame. Uh, you can actually use your existing wall as the back of the case if you want to, or you can um, rabbit the back of the box so that the panel will sit in, and um, you, know, you can install a French cleat with these to to hang them on the wall. And then the face is just a very simple frame that can hold your uh, plexiglass. And um, I tend to use just uh, a really simple hardware in these to hold glass shelves so that I can light them um, without any shadows cast too far down. Um, the one thing about shadow boxes, it's kind of difficult to make an isolated case because your wood is part of it. And so I would only use these for objects like glass or ceramics that you don't have to worry so much about um, pollutants within your environment. Okay, and I finally got my slideshow back. So I'm going to uh, hopefully catch up to all of you and what you're looking at. <clears throat> Okay. So uh, there we are. <laughs> That's a real brief primer on wall cases. Again, your design is only limited by your imagination. So um, if you have some ideas I'd, and have questions about it, I would be happy to, to answer that. Um, so we'll move on, and we'll talk about platforms and plinths, which is kind of um, the biggest thing for me is using these. And how much is enough? Well, enough is enough. I think that you can build these as lightweight as you can, depending on the objects that have to go on them. So really, you can make that determination. If you're showing a Richard Serra, then you're going to have to engineer this to death. Um, for me, most of what I'm working on weigh about 40 pounds, and so I don't really need a, a huge, robust structure. Um, you can make these bespoke, just one of a kind, uh, to suit the ex exhibition or the architecture of your space. Or you can build them as components that you can store and reuse, and that's um, oftentimes um, beneficial if you use them a lot. Uh, standard sizes are great because if you base them on the size of lumber that you get, then there's less cutting involved. And um, it makes it easier when you're doing your exhibition design to plan your space. In platforms, because the objects are out in open air, you really can use materials with less concern about what kind of pollutants there are. Um, I tend to use, um, I tend to use MDF. Uh, half-inch MDF for the tops of mine. Again, I don't have to carry a ton of weight. Um, but MDF can be stinky, so I do prime and paint it to seal it, just so it doesn't make my exhibition space smell like my shop. 
And as you're designing these, you want to think about um, trip hazards, um, how you want to design for wheelchair access, um, what kind of traffic patterns you need to be able to build um, to support. Um, just based on my own experience, I would highly recommend you stay away from acute angles and platforms because they, um, yeah, they can <laughs> they can be problematic. So if you're building them as components, you will want to choose a standard size that works best for you. Uh, plywood and MDF come in a variety of sizes. They're four by eight foot, four by ten foot, five by twelve foot. Um, so whatever you can store whatever is going to work best for you, just design to that standard. Um, can you store them efficiently is, is a question only you can answer. But if you can't, then you might want to consider building them with um, knockdown hardware um, so that you can, again, IKEA-ize these and break them into flat boards and, and um, just set them aside in, in small piles. <clears throat> And then I highly recommend you build a variety of heights, because you don't want to have just a static straight platform. You want to have some design options. And so um, even if you're building them all to 4 by 8, maybe some are 6 feet tall, or 6 inches tall, some are 12 inches tall, some are 18. Um, but that's an aesthetic choice. Um, when it comes to fit and finish, so if you're building platforms and you have a large area to go with. You're going to have seams. So you're going to have to decide how much punishment that's going to have to take. If you want your seams to be invisible, then your structure is going to have to meet and support those seams so that as people are installing artwork, they're not cracking all your hard work and making them unsightly. Um, what I tend to do is to not hide the seams, but use them as a design element. So I chamfer the edges of where all the boards meet. So there's a clean seam. It's obvious, but it looks more like it's a design element rather than a um, mistake. <clears throat> and then if you if you don't have time to dress up the front edge, you can overhang the, the top of the framework by a couple inches. And that hides all that work underneath and, and um, is a lot quicker for installation. Um, paints should be at least an eggshell finish, just because you're going to have people inevitably stepping on them, unless your guards are really on top of things. Um, but even then, during um, installation, it makes it easier to clean. And um, just a word of caution, if you are making white platforms like in the photograph, make sure your um, technicians do not wear dark wash jeans that day. Um, if there's an area that requires access, like in my case, my light switches are over a platform. And so I put down a thin sheet of uh, frosted acrylic with the frosted side up, and that way people can walk on that without um, soiling the platforms. So we're coming, coming to the end of this. Um, some things that I'd like to have you think about are that you don't always have to make things square and straight and flat. Um, you can easily make circles uh, using a bandsaw, um, and they look great under certain certain kinds of objects. Um, they remove trip hazards. If you've got a good chop saw or table saw, you can make regular polygons of any number of sides, and um, you know honeycombs lock together in a really cool way. Um, so there are ways that you can add some, some punch to your exhibit. Um, you can use multiple sizes and stack them up like a ziggurat. You can really um, add a little pop to your exhibits that way. Um, in the case that's in the photograph, I was thinking um, we had you know, black garments in a white gallery. And I wanted to add a little bit of um, texture to the show. And so I built three different angled platforms. And the boards are twisted, so you can you know, you can add a lot of visual interest to your spaces by um, just experimenting a little bit. Um, there are also simple ways to make uh, ellipses. Uh, they're 
YouTube videos about uh, different jigs that you can build to cut uh, shapes. And um, there are materials available if you want to make curved spaces. There are bendable plywoods like kerf core and um, wiggle wood that you can buy that you can get a really nice smooth base uh, even on a curved uh, platform surface. So I encourage you to, um, you know, as you develop skills or as you develop your ideas, step up your game. Um, the case that's pictured here is from the VNA's uh, free to color exhibition, and they've gone to incorporating mirrors and fiber optic lighting and um, you know, really made it uh, a pretty powerful presentation. You can work with your architecture and try to reflect that in the cases that you build. Um, bring in some really funky design that matches the objects that you've got uh, in the show. If your objects are especially sensitive, you can really look more deeply into how you can actively clean the environment within the case by building um, desiccant chambers. Um, I didn't really touch too much on specialty materials, but there are some great uh, aluminum panels, um, plastics that you can use that are bendable, uh, shapeable, have brighter colors, um, and those are all worth exploring if you have the time and the budget. And then there are a lot of articles out uh, in the world on museum casework. This is just one example um, from John Zarin on, um, you know, looking into what the big museums are doing and trying to emulate them at whatever scale you um, can achieve. So I constantly go to um, different resources and try to find out, you know, what could, what could I do if I had a budget and. Uh, if I don't have the budget, then I, you know, how can I scale it down to something that I can work with? And um, I do have to put in a plug for packing in that uh, respect. There's a great uh, forum on our website where people share ideas, and um, you can learn a lot. All right, Jim. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so that is all I have. I apologize for the. I lost my slides a few times here and there, so um, I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, you did a really good job on uh, keeping the balls in the air as you came in and out with your presentation, so uh, good job. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, first one was uh, uh, one of the viewers wanted to have uh, um, more examples of barrier film examples other than the uh, Marva seal, or are there other ones they can consider using? Yeah, there's um, Marble seal seems to be the most accepted one. Um, there's a liquid called Camder 176 that has had been initially tested and was successful, but over time they found that just because wood is an organic material and it expands and contracts, that the film wouldn't hold up to that, and so it eventually broke down. Um, John Zarin in that article, um, they actually use that as the glue for their wood joints. They use the camter as the glue, and that um, helps somewhat. But he actually builds all of his case interiors out of aluminum. Um, you can use formica as a, as a barrier, but you have to bear in mind that the contact cement that you use is not um, it's not very friendly and needs to cure for a long time and outgas for a long time before you would put it within a case. Um, but I really don't think there's that much else. You can uh, laminate aluminum onto a plywood, um, you know, if you have that kind of uh, skill and tooling available. Um, so is there some just off the top of my head? That's what I would think. Yeah, uh, a balance of trying to consider how well the uh, objects contained within the case and how the pollutants are going to be uh, either released and trying to uh, control that in another way compared to, like you were saying, uh, sacrificial elements uh, could help mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, compensate where you might not have the right barrier film or something like that. Right, right. Or trying to have layers of protection, obviously, is, is the best, right? 
Right, and it and it really all comes down to what is it that you're showing in the in the case. I mean, if you're showing ceramics or stone, really pretty much don't have to think about it. I mean, just at that point, you would just maybe separate if your deck was painted with latex paint, you would separate it with a little bit of mylar, you know, cut to the shape that's in direct contact, so that you don't end up with any kind of paint transfer, or um, you know, if it's a plastic object, plasticizer migration between the the paint and the object. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next mm -hmm. one was a question that uh, one of the other attendees uh, uh, helped answer the question, so I'll just kind of lay it out mm -hmm. so you can see where it, mm -hmm. where it lands. Uh, they were talking about the French cleats uh, in the wall cases and do they uh, be uh, getting attached to the wall. Obviously, we're talking about, uh, obviously, ideally, you want to hit the stud to get a nice, good mm -hmm. bite, but uh, mm -hmm. depending on where that... Uh, case is going on the wall. Uh, we were talking about uh, toggle bolts in the discussion, so I want to make sure everybody who didn't catch that in the general chat. Uh, the recommendation was toggle bolts uh, for a hollow wall, uh, mm -hmm. wherever you couldn't hit a stud. Um, right. But there's also, you got to make sure uh, you have a hollow wall. If it's a solid wall, obviously there's other anchors out there specifically made for solid walls. But right. having that cleat, as you know, uh, allows you to do, distribute that weight of that whole case and the objects. So depending on the weight capacity of that anchor times the number of anchors you use would help distribute that weight. Mm -hmm. um, so we've kind of went around with some of the ideas on that to the general chat. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that or we can go to the next question. Um, I mean... Yeah, you just have to think about what's going to actually go in the case. If it's, you know, a couple of uh, feathered fans, then it's only the weight of the case that you have to hold up. So maybe even something as simple as an easy anchor, which is just a screw-in drywall anchor, would hold uh, that much weight. But I'd say probably hitting the stud is best. Um, I, in, in my museum, the walls are backed with plywood, so I can pretty much shoot anywhere, and I'm going to hit uh, something really, really tough. Um, if you if it's really heavy and you can only use the hollow part of the wall, maybe your cleat is as wide as the top part, but really tall, and you can get more anchors in to distribute the weight even further. Um, but yeah, I think I think toggles and mollies would, would be um, the way to go if you had to have um, hollow walls. Because remember, all the weight's going straight down, so it's pulling perpendicular to the screws. It's not like it's going to be pulling out from the wall. Right more of a sheer force. Yeah, more of a sheer. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we had two questions kind of related uh, to the uh, ADA requirements. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you put that in, in mind when you, you're doing your uh, casework and the layout of the exhibits. And um, mm -hmm. so you take that in count. Uh, but also there was uh, the other question was, um, uh, including, you know, low and no vision, uh, mobility mm -hmm. issues, so forth. I mean, what are the kind of things that you've come up with that help uh, meet those requirements? Yeah, for example, the, the wall-mounted cases are um, a particular issue with people with vision impairments. And so if that's a concern, um, what's been recommended is to build a rail below it that is um, at a height that a cane would detect so that you have um, the ability for people with low vision to navigate around those. Um, we have a case on campus. There's a museum of hearing aids. And in order to be ADA compliant, they made all the cases three inches deep. Um, the problem was that their objects weren't all three inches deep. And so they ended up really limiting what they could actually show. So it is a matter of finding a balance. But there are definitely ways that you can um, make them more friendly for, for visitors. Um, you know, you'll want to hang the cases. <clears throat> if they're wall-mounted wall cases and you have visitors that use wheelchairs, you know, don't put them so their knees are going to hit when they pull in because they'll probably want to get up a little bit closer. So, yeah, there are definitely um, a lot of issues around that. And, you know, not all the cases are going to be as uh, elegant pedestals um do you have a certain uh 
types that you try and meet? I know obviously the object can dictate uh, a different uh, dimension, but is there some kind of standard you'd like to use? I usually use 40 inches for a standard pedestal. Um, it's a little higher than a tabletop so that your um, typical visitor doesn't have to stoop down, but it's low enough that a person who's in a chair has good um, visibility for the case. Um, rarely would I go, go above 40 inches. And then, like you said, if it's a really tall object, you can go much lower. Um, right. Did I answer the All question? Right. Um, yeah, next question. Um, uh, one of your uh, gallery photos uh, had modular walls, and they were asking if you build them yourself. And are they <laughs> reusable? <laughs> <laughs> I do, and I, I thought about covering that in this talk, and then I thought about trying to fit it all into an hour, and um, I could do an hour just on those walls. Um, Yes, I build them myself. Um, that's the second uh, design that I have uh, come up with. And those are um, multiple ribs that have cutouts in them so you can walk inside the wall to bolt them together. So they're basically four by eight foot by two foot uh, wall units. And they are on wheels. Um, each unit has its own set of wheels, and it, each unit has its own set of leveling seats. So I can really tweak them right into into position. So the first pair or first set that I built, I tried to use that bed hardware like I did with my modular pedestals. And just getting them to line up and hold together was um, too tricky, and they never were quite satisfactory to me. So these, um, you know, I talked about on the platforms, you showing the seams off. Well, with a wall, you don't necessarily want to do that. So these actually have mating bevels. <clears throat> so when they lock together, they're, they're pretty flat. So, um, so yeah, you can build them yourself. Those are, uh, the ribs are 3 quarter inch plywood. And I used um, a design that I generated for a CNC router to uh, initially cut them and then found that it was faster to just do them ourselves. Um, and then the skin of the wall is just MDO plywood, which is um, not a craft paper face on it, so you don't have to prime them. You just build them and paint them, and you're ready to go. But yeah, I could I could go on about those. <laughs> yeah, I said I was going to think uh, we could uh, do a whole uh, uh, presentation or workshop in portable walls. Uh, yeah, in the and future. I may have posted uh, something on the pack and forum about those walls, so it might it might actually exist already on on the pack and forum. Right on the website. Um, the other question is, uh, what do you recommend for rods for hanging textiles, such as quilts, with sleeves on the back? Oh, boy. That, um, that depends on your quilt. Um, at a minimum, we would sew on a muslin sleeve and use, um, gosh. <laughs> it, it's so um, subjective to the piece. Sometimes we just sew a Velcro, um, a sleeve on the back, but put Velcro on it and hang that directly onto a Velcro board on the wall. Um, if it's a particularly fragile quilt, um, you're going to want to use a larger diameter tube, maybe a two-inch blue archival tube, and um, make a, a system to suspend that out from the wall. Um, and right. we have one quilt that can't bend at all, so that has to go out on a flat slant board because it's um, got shattered silk as part of it, and so it's just degrading all by itself. And so we um, we can't even hang that on the wall. So so it's really subjective to what the object's state is. Um, we did a, a Connecting to Collections Care webinar that covers all of that, and I will post it in, in the handout. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, what vendors would you recommend for Audi tested fabric for case interiors? <clears throat> um, I would look at test fabrics. Um, they tend to have uh, pretty good materials. And there's another vendor who I will send to Susan <laughs> to put on the discussion list because I can't think of their name 
off the top of my head. Um, but you know, with any of those two, it's that's slightly subjective because different runs of the same material might test differently. So you, you know, if you can't test it yourself, you go with reputable sources and um, hope that they haven't changed their manufacturing process <laughs> since they were tested. So. All right. All right. We got one more. Okay. And the possibility of finding a barrier film uh, you, list, uh, you list, listed, can I use some specific type of painting? So some sort of uh, sealer, if you couldn't use a barrier, basically. You mm -hmm. mentioned the camp or before. Or is there anything else that people can use as a sealer? Well, um, uh, you know, it depends on the object. If, it's, um, if the objects aren't fragile, a low VOC latex paint is is fine. Ceramics, glass, um, perhaps even gold, since it doesn't tarnish, but I'd be really hesitant to, <laughs> to do that without a uh, conservator's sign-off. Um, but I think that you really want to try to find some way to, to separate that if, if the objects are, are fragile. Um, I think that marble seal is pretty available, but I'm not sure. Um, if it's always in the budget <clears throat> for smaller institutions. Uh, Camter, I've used Camter. I think it's a fine product, but like I said, I, you can't um, entirely control how much natural movement there's going to be in the wood in response to humidity changes or temperature changes. And once that splits, then um, you know, you've spent a lot of time and it's not uh, as clean an environment as you would have wanted. Oh. OK. Uh, there's uh, another really good question here. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your role in the exhibition planning process? Are you brought in in the beginning of the planning stages with some design ideas? Um, yes. <laughs> My whole job title is exhibition designer preparator. So I'm, I'm soup to nuts in my institution because we're a very small staff. Um, so yeah, I'm brought in right at the at the get-go, and so uh, we don't have a staff conservator. We um, have uh, we belong to a regional conservation lab, and we get advice from them. Uh, we have colleagues at other local museums who we can who we can call on, and we'll bounce ideas off of them and make decisions with uh, with their input and through our own research to um, you know to find the best solutions, but. Yeah, when it comes to designing the spaces and everything, I'm the person who's looking into, you know, are we accessible? Um, are we limiting our audience by what we're building? Um, are we putting anybody in, in danger? Um, so, yeah, that's my role's kind of uh, right there at the get-go. But if it wasn't, <laughs> you were just <laughs> doing the cases. I would think you'd want to be in those early uh, planning stages and meetings, which I think this person is getting to, which is I think is crucial because uh, you, know, you know the more you have time to really look at the situation and, and the problems that could arise and how to solve those problems, the better I would think. Yeah, I mean your cases should be um, you know considered right up front as far as pre preventive conservation goes. So your conservators should be working with your your case designers, your case fabricators, and making sure that um, they're meeting all the requirements of the objects that are within. It's that balance there's between nothing, uh, There's nothing ahead. worse than having a curator who has some idea about what something should look at like, and it's just not something that the designers or the preparators can do. Yeah, yeah. It's that it balance be, of practicality, really and preservation, <laughs> and design. Yeah. Um, then you know I you have to be to prepared for the unex unexpected with some of this. I was at the um, materials conference a couple of years ago at the Smithsonian, and the uh, Indianapolis Museum was talking about their casework for their African exhibition, and they tested everything. I mean. They can do their own in-house audio testing. They tested every finish on every board that went into the cases. And 
when they moved objects after it was time to rotate them out, they found all this discoloring on the bases themselves, and it turned out it wasn't the cases, it was the objects that was, <laughs> that was polluting the inside of the cases. And so, you know, that's where more active uh, ventilation can come in. Yeah, and along that line, uh, in January, um, we're going to be doing a free webinar on microclimates and how to build them and how to determine what they should be and that kind of stuff. So that, um, you know, pay attention to our website to see when that comes up. I'll probably post it in December. Great. I think we're we're done. Um, I will I, I will put together a, a conservation suppliers list. I'll add the um, the quilt webinar to the handouts, and um, maybe you can get me a link to the article on on portable walls, and I'm, I'll post that. And okay. I'll also post the assignment and the um, the quiz and uh, keep talking in the discussion list and I think uh, we'll see you next week with Brent Powell talking about safety um, in installing exhibits. Thank you all for all the nice pictures that you sent of measuring light in your museum. Yes, they were helpful. great. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Jim. And um, I think you did really well considering that you